Um, yeah, what was your takeaways from that, Nate? You enjoy that panel? Ah, here uh, yeah. we are. Hello. Ah. Hello, Mark. How are you? Thank you One for uh, having me. There we go. Hello, Ken. You got us now? We got you. Hello, sir. We're right Thank you for that. Apologies for the slight delay there in um, uh, switching across. Let me just share a screen with you folks. So while that's loading up there, um, Ian, just let me say kudos to yourself and the uh, entire consensus team for pulling together this virtual conference, uh, proving uh, again that innovation is not just possible, but, but frankly, uh, really appreciated in a time of uh, global crisis. So sincere kudos on that. I, I caught the end of last session, and if they're all as good as that, I think it's a fantastic event. So many, many thanks for the opportunity on behalf of both uh, Mark and myself uh, to chat to you and the, and the audience tuned in today. I wanted to link this back a little bit to kind of programmable money because to me, interest in programmable money is really driven by inefficiencies in today's uh, financial ecosystems uh, and in their instruments and in their ability to respond to the twin uh, forces of globalization or said another way, you know, buying and selling goods and services to and from a more global audience and digitization, uh, digitization in, in all its forms, not, not just the nature of the products and services that we consume, but also the channel we use to access them and, and how we actually consume them. Those have all changed. However, for programmable money uh, to deliver on its potential, it needs to be built on a system of trust. Trust both in the identity of the parties uh, to a transaction itself, trust also in the good or the service that's being exchanged, and trust in the, in the regulations, the protections and the rights uh, uh, that govern the transaction and actually protect uh, the rights of both the transacting parties. So that's why we're so excited uh, about the potential of blockchain and smart uh, contracts uh, to build trust in supply chains. And that's why we think the uh, coming at supply chains and building off it is really fundamental to the, to the true delivery of benefits of, uh, of uh, programmable money. So to help me today, I'm delighted to be joined by my uh, good friend and partner, Mark Kaplan, um, to, the, to this, I suppose, virtual stage. Uh, Mark is a partner and, and CEO and founder, actually, of Invisible and creator of the Wholesale Traceability System. So we're going to spend about the next 10, 12 minutes or so giving you a glimpse into uh, how we partner to build that system uh, of trust across supply chains, and then hopefully leave a couple of minutes for questions uh, at the end. So consumers today increasingly want to know the story behind the goods and the services that they consume. Uh, they, they want to know the source of the food. Is it was it you know was it uh, is it American? Is it local? Um, how you know its journey from uh, its point of production right through to the plate or to the uh, merchant point of sale? Is it organic? Is it sustainable? They also want to know the authenticity of and, and provenance of luxury items. Are, are they what they claim to be? Did they come from who they claim to have come from? And, and this, the authenticity and expiry dates also of drugs. I mean, this has been highlighted recently as for maybe the first time, some of us are buying our uh, medications, our prescription med medications online rather than in person. And it's not just consumers, uh, COVID-19 has also highlighted uh, the need from both governments and, and from companies all around the world to really understand you know, where is their stuff? Where is my stuff? We're seeing it as people search for PPE, we're seeing it as people search for pharmaceutical grade drugs. So uh, we know that consumers are demanding this transparency and security, and we know that they're also prepared to vote with their wallet. Uh, we know from McKinsey that 25 or say 65 percent of the Generation Z are uh, trying to learn the origins of just about anything that they buy. And we know that 75 percent of consumers will switch food brands uh, based on the information that's displayed to them on the product so that they can make a, a more affordable or sorry, a more informed choice. So we know that building trust and transparency is important, but it's also bloody hard to do. Right. The pain point really lies in the lack of end-to-end -end visibility across the ever-expanding supply chain and in the need to establish trust at the point of origination. So these gaps allow bad actors to enter in and to introduce fakes or to misrepresent uh, the products and services. And this ultimately hurts both the brands themselves, it also hurts consumers, it hurts us all. 
So we, to solve for this lack of end-to-end -end visibility in supply chains and to help build this trust, we created the MasterCard provenance solution. Now, uh, I, I listened to the earlier conversations about uh, private and public and permissioned and non-permissioned chains. And, and, and in reality, we've taken a particular approach here, but our, but our approach is built on a variety of different underlying technologies. But we created the overall solution, which is more than just blockchain. I'll come to that in a second. Um, uh, and we partnered with our good friends at Invisible then to address food traceability systems, which we're going to talk to you a little bit about today. So we built this particular example on our MasterCard proprietary uh, blockchain technology. It's industry agnostic and it helps brands provide visibility into the product journeys uh, and deliver a clear record of traceability, right in this instance for uh, seafood and, and fish, right from origin through to the consumer. Now the transparent flow of information enabled by this shared trust on all participants across the ecosystem um, uh, is the foundation on which many other validation points uh, can be integrated. And this is really where we start to bring in the kind of concepts of programmable money. So we can start to integrate uh, IoT devices where we can track temperature and conditions of transit. So did a good uh, and service arrive in the condition in which it was intended to be used? We can automate uh, rules for very costly and, and labor intensive manual processes like payments and financing and invoice discounting and factoring and bills of lading um, through the implementation of smart contracts. And we can integrate payment instruments into it, both those coming from uh, MasterCard and from traditional fiat-based uh, currency forms of payment today, but also as central bank issued digital currencies and, non, uh, and other forms of digital assets become acceptable, we will integrate those into, into uh, uh, the provenance solution itself, sorry, as well. So to give you a sense of how this all works and to take the specific example of seafood, I'm gonna hand across to Mark and maybe ask him to talk a little bit about how we've been able to do this. Bring the chain together, integrate the supply chain, but also create the identity at the point of uh, origin. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Ken. And so Invisible is a sustainable seafood company. And as um, Ken mentioned, we built the whole chain traceability system specifically for our supply chains but have since reapplied it to other commodities as well, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but to do this, we partnered with um, MasterCard and with Topco Associates, who's the largest grocer cooperative in the United States to deliver fully a, a product line of fully traceable seafood for their full circle market brand, starting with KVAT Food City but then expanding across their over 50 grocer uh, network. And so the, what it does is we've, we've enabled the ability to capture information at the source and then track the journey of our seafood from um, Alaska to, uh, to our grocers um, across the United States. Um, we're also sourcing from, we have 11 supply chains uh, from seven suppliers across six, six countries. So we're also applying this approach from India, Mozambique, Mauritius, uh, Mexico, Peru, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and so what, we're what we do is we capture elements like sustainability information, um, labor practices, and other information that's important to enable consumers to be able to make decisions and make purchases with their values. Now, there's also a misperception, we feel, that fully traceable, sustainable supply chains are more expensive. This, we feel, is typically because the companies enabling traceability don't work in supply chains. So the costs are misaligned with the critical stakeholders and traceability is now also not synonymous with transparency. So on top of the traceability solution, we also have implemented a business practice of um, price transparency. Um, so the result has been that our grocery partners are paying less and our producers are making more. So we've found out this, we've now proven this win-win-win solution by combining transparency with traceability and a partner like MasterCard who has a, who's a broader stakeholder in the supply chain as well. 
Um, so Ken, can you flip to the next slide, please? And so with a click of a solution, with a click of the smartphones, um, the consumer is able to scan a QR code. And within that, it takes the consumer to a, um, a storytelling experience about the product. And so um, Ken, now I guess this is back to you. Perfect, Mark, thank you for that. Sure. Uh, so provenance as we discussed then kind of helps us put in some of the foundations in terms of trust across the supply chain and, and identity uh, on goods and services while delivering efficiencies and, and meeting an inherent uh, consumer need. But as we think about uh, industry solutions and as we think about how they might evolve, but digitizing workflows and embedding conditional payment capabilities are at the heart of what we're actually really developing here. Um, because transparency around the movement of goods um, uh, is more sustainable when there's also transparency around the actual movement of money and the, and the exchange of value between participants on the chain itself. So businesses will need a, a simple, efficient way of knowing when they will be paid, by who, for what. And that's true in food, as it is indeed in any other supply chain for any other product or service. So as we digitize these workflows between potential buyers and suppliers, um, we can improve efficiencies tied to payments and, and to delivery. So for, for example, uh, we can improve and, and we plan to do this through our track uh, BPS business payment services, which were also announced today. Um, so we plan to deliver uh, efficiencies to some of the traditional kind of paper intensive processes like cargo manifest, bills of lading, um, uh, uh, ba bankers acceptances, standby letters of credit, um, uh, all of those can now be programmed on top of this ecosystem of digital and, and trust and, and identity. And we can also start to program in some conditional financing capabilities. So you can implement logic like um, you know, if uh, X amount of goods and services have, a, have arrived, then apply for uh, uh, or, or offer up a discount on the invoice of this or factor that. We can start to implement that type of business logic and, and then money truly starts to become uh, programmable. So um, uh, with Provenance, uh, we're really uh, uh, creating this ecosystem here um, and together with our other efforts uh, in blockchain, we really think this is gonna deliver on, on the future of supply chains. So many thanks uh, Ian and team uh, for the chance to talk to you guys today. Happy to, to take some questions and hopefully we've got about five minutes to do so. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for the presentation, guys. Um, uh, first thing I'm kind of wondering, uh, Mark, on this, this is, uh, you know, this being supply chain, um, it's a it's a pivot from, from MasterCard's core business payments. Talk to me about how this fits in with the rest of MasterCard's uh, uh, business strategy. Sure. Um, no problem. So from what I know of MasterCard. And I'll help you out on that one, Mark. <laughs> it's like from my experience with MasterCard. Um, no, so, you know, what's interesting and why we, and I'll, I'll take this from why we really chose MasterCard as a partner, um, given that there are so many blockchain solutions. Um, we chose MasterCard as a partner because of their role in supply chains and broader in the, um, in the retail environment. So unlike other companies, MasterCard has a presence in grocery where we primarily sell products, but they also have payment solutions that we're planning on implementing for our producers. And ultimately this helps farmers, our farmers and fishermen who we work with, whether they're paid, um, in, whether they're paid for their goods digitally, we're working on financial inclusion uh, scenarios, um, we're working on food access scenarios, um, given the uh, realities of, of COVID. Um, and then furthermore, on areas of mislabeling and building trust and consumer confidence, they have very strong um, counter fraud and counterfeiting um, uh, capabilities. So it, working with them really helps rebuild consumer confidence in, um, you know, in an industry that's riddled with mislabeling, fraud, and, and all kinds of other labor rights shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, and Ken. Um... Sh shenanigans, and he hands back to the Irish guy. Um, the... <laughs> so maybe, maybe I would add a 
few things to that. I, I, I think, um, and this topic has come up a, a lot, it is very hard to build a new network. Um, th that is just a difficult thing to do. I think one of the advantages of working with a brand like MasterCard is we already have a network. Um, we're already connected uh, across 210 countries around the world with about 70 million merchants and brands about 25,000 banks and financial institutions and, and every government and regulator. But it, it, so uh, there's clearly, we're clearly in the business of, of payments, but we're also in the, in the business of data. And, and frankly, we believe in adding value to the left and to the right of a core payments transaction. And we see, and, and as Mark pointed out, we run counterfeit programs, we have franchise rules and chargebacks to protect the rights of consumers. We have cyber and security to make sure bad actors don't do bad things. We see this as a natural extension, giving people confidence um, that the good and service that they actually bought is what it's claiming to be and that it came from where it claims to come from. And we think this taps into a rising tide of nationalism, but also a rising tide of, of, uh, of consumer behaviors where really they're becoming a little bit more belief driven in, in their purchasing decisions. So we think there's a lot of reasons why this makes a ton of sense for a company of our, like ours to lean in heavily on. Mm, interesting. And, and uh, to add to that, what what parts, of, what different payments uh, products are going to be integrated from MasterCard? So um, to uh, day one, we're going to integrate um, most of the payments that exist here. I mean, there's there's payments across the whole chain. We've got consumer payments at the merchant point of sale. So those are, you know, the full range of payments that you would have today. A anybody's card payments, whether it's our competitors or, or our own, they all uh, come in through the same um, kind of merchant interface at the at the point of sale. Um, then uh, MasterCard, as, as you guys probably know, has, has spent many billions of dollars uh, buying capabilities and building capabilities within B2B payments over the past number of years. And that takes us way beyond just uh, commercial cards and, and kind of VCNs, which would be traditional instruments that kind of play into that space. But we've been buying uh, fast ACH uh, um, uh, companies that, that have the underlying technology for fast ACH, like Vocalink, um, Transfast, and many other companies that, that really give us the kind of richness of, of data um, uh, that we need to deploy a broader range of B2B capabilities. And that really talks to our ambition here which is truly to be a multi-rail company, whether we're moving a digital asset or, or some, some form of digital value on a blockchain, or whether we're moving something between accounts, or whether we're moving something over a card rail, we really want to have the ability to offer up that multi-rail capability to all of our clients, be they consumers, merchants, businesses, or, or governments, or indeed make those capabilities available to our partners. I mean, we're, we're implementing, um, we're planning on implementing contactless payments across our supply chains, for example, um, to further, some of our producers are in quarantine right now. And in order to maintain food security, contactless payments is becoming an increasingly important capability at the source. And we've now since reapplied that capability in things like digital identity with our with vanilla farmers in madagascar which is another supply chain we've deployed in um so just to give you a few other examples of, of the work that we're doing with them on payments i've got a quick question uh, sort of a bit of an inside baseball question um and forgive me if you if you if you've made this said this already but what, i just wondered what type of blockchain stuff did you use is it your own thing or did you use i don't know hyperledger or something like that so no so ian this oh apologies go for it mark no, and i'll come in again please no no i was just going to say we're, whole chain isn't a blockchain solution we partner with MasterCard as the blockchain solution. Yeah, Wait. yeah. So, uh, Ian, just to maybe pick up the questions specific to, to provenance, um, the the integration into our broader um, uh, endpoints was really important to us. So, we've delivered this particular solution on our own proprietary uh, blockchain technology, which is interwoven into our network today. So, it has access to all of those endpoints. Um, but we are a, a multi-chain company. I know there's been a lot of talk about R3 and Corda there, and, and we use those types of capabilities in uh, uh, for other use cases. Um, but with Mark and the team, and indeed more broadly for provenance, we're, we're going to be using the MasterCard uh, proprietary blockchain technology. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, you know, I was going to say why, you know, build your own network, but I guess you 
got quite a lot of um, endpoints there. You've got quite a lot of users on that platform. Yeah, we do. Um, the, I mean, again, I, I think, um, and we haven't shut the door on using other networks. We're working with many of the uh, open and public uh, uh, providers. Uh, we've been very public in our support of, of R3 in particular. Um, so the door is not shut, but when we started out on our journey on blockchain a number of years back, uh, we spent a lot of time really looking very specifically at the security throughput, you know, data, ability to carry data, uh, ability to carry value uh, on the chain itself. And, and at the time, um, you know, we really didn't see a, an option other than to actually uh, build something ourselves. And in building it ourselves, we were able to weave it into the existing connections, the APIs, the gateways that we have with our merchants, with our clients and with our governments. So rather than have to go through a net new implementation with us, they now can use their existing APIs, their existing services and access our chain through that. So being a network already in this instance does have uh, some advantages. Do you think there's maybe a little bit of companies like yourselves having a sort of this dalliance with Libra? Or, you know, it made you think to yourself, well, we should really just be building our own stuff. There's maybe a bit of retrenchment. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, look, I, I think I think we've all learned a lot over the course of the past couple of years, and, and we've all had to adapt our positions as new information comes to light. I, I think for us, we're never going to stand in the way of progress. Um, but but we also have are a very principled company, so we're we're very driven by trying to do things in the right way that protects the interests of consumers of governments. That that's an open and fair ecosystem. Uh, we won't do anything ourselves that that we think is. Um, you know, it, it is closed or uh, would leave us open to, um, you know, a, a, any kind of a breach of, of regulatory or compliance uh, regulations in any of the countries that we do business in. So, uh, you know, as uh, other people's uh, blockchains gain scale and, and, and kind of start to move into a place where actually they're conforming to some of those rules, whether it's e-money or whether it's uh, AML and KYC, then we will support them uh, across our network as well. And we've seen some very positive moves moves from some of the companies out there over the past couple of years. Are you saying there that you might join Libra again? <laughs> Who knows what the future holds? Um, we certainly stay clo very close uh, uh, to Facebook um, uh, and the team over there um, and, and, and would certainly um, think that, that some of their more recent developments are probably very positive uh, things. Um, the moment we're out, um, but we, uh, we, we continue to wish them well and we do think that uh, uh, that some of the steps that they've taken are very positive. Well, what what kind of uh, <laughs> uh, steps would you be looking for uh, for Libra when considering? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll take each step as we go here. Um, the, uh, the 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 team over there have a have a pretty. Um, big agenda ahead of them already as they get the foundation up and running, as they look to secure their, their license um, uh, from Swiss or other authorities, and, and as they look to convince different governments around the world um, uh, around the, the kind of capabilities that they're trying to bring there, bring to bear. And, and, and you know, we look, we wish them well with that. Gotcha. Um, and this, uh, uh, that's my polite that's way of avoiding uh, that question. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan. And, and, to ten, uh, just 10 seconds uh, uh, to bring it back to supply chain real quick. Uh, how do you ensure the integrity of the link between the physical item, the salmon, and the digital representation? Yeah, so we, we really create a digital twin. So whole chain captures records um, at each step of the supply chain. And what we do is we don't write to MasterCard blockchain until the recipient of the product has a confirmed receipt. So when the, when the creator of the record sends the product, they also send the record with it. Then the next step in the supply chain accepts. Upon acceptance, they're making a claim that the digital record matches the physical product that they've received. And at that point is when we write to blockchain and we make the immutable record. That then follows and actually builds a composite record as the product goes up the supply chain. Within whole chain, we've built the different types of actions like consolidation. So one, one container of shrimp being bunched into, into two 
or a transformation like a whole fish being cut up into portions um, or like a vanilla extract being um, being made. So those types of actions then follow the steps of the supply chain all the way to the retailer. Um, and we're starting to get other types of machine inputs and ultimately we'll be matching that to payments. And so it'll start to enable a different level of visibility um, vertically across the supply chains. So that's how we do it. And what it's enabled us to do is to bridge from the informal parts of the supply chain to the, um, to the more industrial supply chain, um, which has been a, a, a really interesting and, and unique capability that MasterCard's enabled for us. Very cool, awesome. Well, uh, thank you both for the presentation and for answering our questions. Thank you. Um, well, it's great to have you today. Thank you, Nathan. Um, thank you, Ian, and sure. to the whole team. Thanks, Ken. Talk to you all soon. Take care, guys. Bye. Um, Bye. Other, other thing next up uh, for 3.30 uh, EST is a better way to trade uh, smart contracts for B2B payments. Um, joining us is uh, uh, Gert Silvest, uh, co-founder at TradeShift, um, as well as Sven Valfels, uh, the CEO of Monarium. Uh, they're going to talk to us about uh, uh, issuing uh, invoices uh, via contract, smart contracts uh, and integrating uh, digital money into those invoices. Um, welcome guys. Thanks. So um, let's, let's start off, tell me a little bit about this. Um, uh, what you got? Sven, do we want to kick it off? I think you need to unmute, turn on the camera. Ah. Oh. He may be missing. Yes, I think Sven is uh, is trying to re-enter. I think he's he's left at the moment. Um, okay. Okay. So maybe Gert, uh, maybe you could uh, chat a little bit about um, uh, your side of things on trade shift. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I can start introducing ourselves and yeah, talking about trade shift. So, so my name is Gert Silvest. I'm co-founder of Trade Shift. So, uh, so uh, we are a company that was founded in in 2010 uh, with the vision to connect every company in the world uh, in order to, to create uh, economic opportunity for those that, that participate in that network. Um, and I have, I'm re wearing a few hats in, in trade shift today. So I'm GM of trade shift frontiers, which is our digital innovation arm. And then I'm VP of, of our network area, which, which is basically our financial services products and our uh, network growth products. And about trade shift, so we started in 2010. We really focus on the collaboration between companies. So we are we are business to business player, and um, and we focus on the hard transactions between businesses. So things like purchase orders, invoices, um, goods receipt, you know, anything related to to the financial side of the supply chain. Um, and we are today more than 1.5 million companies in in the network. Um, and transaction uh, close to, to, to $500 billion uh, a year in the network. Um, and, and coming from the B2B space, I, I think one of, one of the things that led us into the blockchain space was kind of the realization between, you know, the difference between what really happens in the e-commerce space and, and what happens on the B2B scene. Um, and one of the things to realize is like uh, while uh, everything about the e-commerce has been brought about through through you know digitization and and uh, and social networks in the B two C space, uh, you have in the B two B space. So everything that happens in supply chain, you have, you have at least nine transactions happening uh, for every transaction that that happens in in the in the B two C C side of things. Uh, yet, um, more than 90% of all the transactions that happens in B2B, they are not digital today. 
So there's this kind of huge mismatch between the level of digitization in, in the B2C space and the level of digitization in the B2B space. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why we started the company. That was to say, you know, some of the strategies you used uh, to bring about the, the revolution in e-commerce, you must be able to apply the same principles uh, to the B2B space. Um, and I think what really made B2C take off uh, and the social networks that, that today are driving demand, um, that is really incentivizing users to join uh, these marketplaces, and these uh, networks of, of demand and supply and very much incentivize users by giving, giving them access to free stuff, like free services, free content, um, and, and, and similar things. And we haven't really seen the same dynamic play down in the B2B space. So, so we basically asked ourselves that question, like how can you actually incentivize supply chains to digitize? And, and very much believe that the key to that is, is in amongst other things, it's in access to finance. Um, and, and this is kind of where our trajectory and, and what is happening in the blockchain space, though, those two trajectories they met, because you have a few key uh, transactions in the B2B space, like uh, the purchase order, uh, the invoice, where, where you have promises of, of buying something or promises of payments. And, and if you could turn these into uh, to, to actual uh, digital assets that could be uh, executed um, uh, with some reliability and turn into assets that, that can be traded, that's a very, very interesting prospect, uh, prospect in terms of um, giving, giving companies access to finance. And I can hear Sven, Sven joined the call as well. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, yes, we can. Yeah, so well, the, gods yeah. Of the inter- gods of the internet were uh, uh, playing with the connection, as it were. So, um... good. The gods of the internet are aware of your presence. Okay, good. That's a good thing. Sh- should we start the presentation then? Uh, is the host able to? Um... There you go. Can you turn sure. your video? Sure, Sven. If if you um if you have uh, uh if you have something prepared, go go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll uh, if you're also able to turn your video, unless you want to go out and back in again. Okay, we're trying to figure out where we're at. Can you see it? So, and can you hear it from over here? I I can hear you. Yes. Yep. Okay, but well, the video is 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 missing, as it were. So let's try to share a presentation on Zoom. Um, in the meantime, uh, my name is Sven Walfels. I'm joining you from Reykjavik, Iceland. I am one of the co-founders and the CEO of Monarium. Um, as Gert was explaining, we have been working with TradeShift for the past months, um, since the second half of last year, to uh, uh, enable um, the blockchain transactions on supply chains. Um, now, we'd like to thank uh, everybody who was uh, at consensus for so swiftly reacting and reorganizing uh, the conference and, and putting it online. Thank you so much for your efforts. And of course, our hearts and minds are with the healthcare professionals around the world. They're looking after us during these uh, precarious times. Now, um, uh, do you see the presentation? Are you able to present um, the, the slides or is it? Uh, I actually cannot. Um at the at the moment okay so so okay so now let's go on so our mission is to make digital money accessible secure and simple to transact and to conclude the introduction of monarium is that we're the first company authorized to issue e-money on blockchains um and as best we know we are still the only company authorized to issue e-money on blockchains so um are, are the slides visible Can the host please update me with whether or not the slides are visible? Uh, so they're so they're not visible at the moment. Um, maybe try uh, sending them to to this address, and we can make them visible for you. Okay. So um, 
There's another address being provided for to make the slides visible. Fantastic. Um, We're juggling a couple of laptops over here in Reykjavik, uh, both MacBooks, uh, both relatively new. And if there's anything that Iceland is good at, it's connectivity. So we hope that this okay. is not with us. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm joining the session from a, from a second login here. So I'm seeing if I, I can share my screen. So okay. I just seems I got access here. All right, so that seems to work so far. So let me see if I can also share my screen. Okay, let me know if that works. Yep, that's perfect. Fantastic, okay. thank you. So no get, um, if we go back to slide one, whoever has the slides, yeah, so um, that's done. Removing friction for finance. That's what we're all about. Number two, the introduction. I, I just completed that while we're fixing the tech stuff. And so here about Monarium. Um, so we're bringing money to blockchains to enable blockchain adoption in mainstream business, such as supply chains, for example, uh, also in capital markets and e-commerce. So the global modern economy relies on sharing and partnering across borders and sectors. and Blockchains are ideally suited for um, helping power global commerce in that way because um, they power fast, efficient, and reliable online transactions of digital assets. Um, we believe that most, if not all, mainstream assets belong on shared distributed ledgers, um, securities, invoices, purchase orders, and claims. Uh, most regular businesses, however, rely on traditional money as short-term store of value and means of exchange they therefore need trusted and proven forms of regular money on blockchain to settle transaction. And that is what we're providing them with. Next slide, please. Um, com compared to other information industries, such as media and telecommunications, uh, banking and payments is stuck in the early days of the internet as a fragmented collection of closed incompatible silos, a system of mini tells, if you will. So the case for blockchain payments is compelling, independent of having other assets on chain. For consumers and non-financial businesses, global payments are costly, slow, and restricted to certain hours of the day. Even in fairly well-served served markets such as Europe, the cost of sending an amount corresponding to thousands of euros or pounds using banks or challengers can be a significant fraction of the funds and take hours or even days. And automation and flexibility is inhibited by rigid and proprietary APIs. So at Monarium, we significantly reduce the friction of moving money. Uh, using our services, costs are much lower and the level of service much higher than traditional financial services can offer. Unlike banks and their challengers, uh, Monarium money always moves in seconds across borders for pennies all hours of the day, every day of the year. So uh, while we outcompete banks and challengers with money on chain in like for like comparison in payments, that's only the beginning. Issuing money on blockchains opens up a lot more. It was not possible to improve lighting by improving candles. It took electricity and incandescent bulbs over 100 years ago to make lighting available, reliable, and affordable. Similarly, we cannot improve current financial infrastructure without adopting a radically different approach. In our view, assets on blockchains hold that potential for finance and commerce. They enable selective and reliable sharing of value across borders and industries and they liberate users from closed silos of information and proprietary APIs, and they're always on. The banks and the current payment providers are the candle makers. They are destined to burn out and fade away. In our view, money belongs on chain. So um, we are uh, issuing money on chain to remove intermediaries. Programmable Monarium money on blockchain it removes whole categories of traditional intermediaries, such as payment services. It enables trusted, direct, and atomic exchanges of assets 
online. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Monerium launched last summer. We are now fully licensed across Europe and offer euros, dollars, and sterling on Ethereum. And we will support Algorand later this year. Access to our money is through open standards on permissionless chains, uh, for example, ERC-20 contracts on Ethereum. So you can build whatever you like using our money. Uh, for those of us who are nerds, it's uh, Turing complete fiat money on chain. So uh, we are excited to have partnered with TradeShift, uh, a leading innovator in global e-commerce. And we've done some amazing things together with TradeShift that uh, we hope will change the global economy. So to tell you more, here's over to Gary. All right, thank, thanks for that, Sven. Um, so I managed to cover introduction to myself, uh, a little bit about the B2B space that, that uh, we are operating in, um, a little bit about um, the frictions and the lack of digitization. And I just talked about like, how could you actually incentivize um, digitization in the, of the supply chains? Um, so that's really the question here for us. What, what if we could solve that with digital technology? And as we started in 2010, we were definitely a, a non-blockchain player. So our focus was very much on, you know, on the very basics of uh, digitizing transactions, bringing things on a, on a common standard form. And what we typically go is go to large, you know, Fortune 5000 segment enterprise buyers. And then uh, typically starting by digitizing electronic invoicing for, for the entire supply chains, but over time moved into to other things like marketplaces, uh, ordering financial services and, and so on. Um, so today uh, we are the largest uh, B2B network that is focusing purely on, on, on this kind of uh, transactions. Uh, I mentioned 1.5 million companies in the network transacting close to, to $500 billion a year. Um, across 190 countries. So really serving the, the big global and, and very diverse supply chains here. Uh, and if you look at these supply chains, uh, you will start seeing an interesting pattern. And that is, um, they are like small waterfalls of, uh, of held up liquidity. So typically someplace you have a very large buyer that is generating a lot of demand uh, uh, throughout the supply chain. And as you know, in business, typically there are payment terms involved that can be 30 days, 60 days. Uh, and that means that every step in the supply chain, you will have this uh, liquidity gap when you're going to pay your, your salaries or your sellers. Uh, some places in these chains, you, you have loops of liquidity and so on. But overall, if you look globally at any point in time, it's $9 trillion in liquidity that is locked up between companies. So that's simply just buyers owing money to sellers, $9 trillion. Um, and, and the key challenge here across the world is, is that liquidity gap. And I think we saw it on the, the last financial uh, crisis and we see it um, again here, here during the, the COVID uh, crisis we have right now that as uh, something like this happens that systemically affects the whole financial system, you will see companies holding on to their money and that trickles down to the supply chain. In the last financial uh, crisis, we saw payment terms extending to nine months, 12 months, and even beyond that. So, so basically suppliers uh, payment getting uh, delayed indefinitely. Um, but what if we could actually uh, um, do something about this. Um, so let's say uh, we could incentivize companies based on, on, on their behavior on the supply chain. So if you have buyers owing money to you, um, one of the use cases here is, is the deep tier finance. So today it's very common between, uh, let's say large buyers and, and sellers to have some sort of early payments programs in place. So basically you plug in a fund and the relationship and instead of getting paid on day 60, you get paid on day one or two um, against um, uh, a rebate on, on what is outstanding on the invoice. Um, deep tier finance is basically the idea that you can extend that credit further out in the supply chain. So if you have a million dollars outstanding between a large buyer and a seller, what if, if, 
if further payments down the line could be guaranteed in 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 the old money in that that uh, tier one of, of the supply chain. Um, that would address um, a lot of the the credit gaps, which uh, uh, on a uh, global estimated base, uh, only fifteen to twenty percent of all the credit needs of companies are today being served by 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 banks and and other uh, sources of funding. So so it's a big uh, global problem. In, in fact, it, it's on the top three of um, of the World Bank's. Uh, uh, list of, of challenges for SMPs globally uh, as barriers to growth. Another use case is, is FX. So, so in the global supply chains, uh, they are very often international, and that's that's an, uh, a rapidly accelerating trend. So even you have the 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 micro multinationals. So increasingly, companies deal with cross border payments, and FX is a major cost in this. Um, and um, if you can save um, ten thousand dollars per one million dollars in 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 cross border uh, by using alternative infrastructures, that that can be a pretty nice saving for for most companies. And finally, you have other uh, ways of incentivizing. So let's say um, um, today you have limited uh, visibility into into supply chains. Uh, for example, uh, in, in, in scope three or in, in the extended supply chains and what, what is the carbon footprint. Um, and, and today, uh, the only method that is really used that is push method where very large buyers uh, try to force the requirements on, onto sellers downstream. But what if you could reward sellers uh, if they improve uh, in, 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 for example, sharing uh, information about their uh, production practices or CO2 footprint um, uh, downstream in the supply chain against uh, rebates on, on, for example, financing. Um, so when we started uh, working with Monerum last, last year, one of the questions was, you know, uh, could blockchain ha have the potential to, to leapfrog open banking? We know open banking is a vision that 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 goes back 15 or, or even 20 years, um, and an attempt uh, which you can see uh, also replicated in many other regions to uh, to to liberate the um, the financial uh, the financial sector uh, and open up for competition for 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 many more companies to offer financial services. Uh, yet we have also seen that. Uh, the financial institutions' resistance to to these uh, uh, regulations have so far uh, been uh, fairly successful. So, so we do believe there are opportunities to leave, leapfrog that. And one of the the uh, ideas here was to say basically, what would happen if you put invoices on the blockchain, and instead of have the separation between uh, a document that says what I'm owing you and the payment actually combine those two things into what you could call a smart invoice. So imagine invoices that settle themselves uh, automatically uh, on chain. So coupling the, the, the settlement itself with, with the promise. Um, and if you could do that, let's say every time a buyer accepts an invoice, you know that invoice is gonna pay itself guaranteed in 30 days. You have an asset suddenly that is as good as money. Um, so if you can issue that kind of asset, it also means you can trade it and you can use it in marketplaces and you can extend it throughout your supply chain. So, so that very simple asset suddenly opens up the potential for, for completely new types of, of financial services um, that can cover whole supply chains, as well as, 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 as promise to do that with, with a much lower friction than you see in, in traditional B2B financial services like uh, SCF, uh, open accounts, uh, financing, factoring, and, and, and dynamic discounting, which have very high friction and, 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 um, and um, uh, high switching costs. Um, and we actually went ahead that, uh, and actually proved that this can be done 
uh, so Tradeshift and Monero together, we uh, we executed the world's first smart invoice settlement together with uh, IKEA Iceland uh, using Monero's uh, licensed e-money. Uh, and that was kind of key to this because we knew we are not going to execute anything related to, uh, to, to business to business transactions unless you understand it's done in a compliant way and in a way that, that, uh, that your accountant can understand and easily sign off. So, so the e-money uh, uh, license uh, regime actually pro pro provided a very nice way of doing that, a clear pattern that is known to, to, uh, to all companies. Um, and then combining that with taking the invoice asset as, as a self-executing asset and doing that. And we did that in a few ways, um, both directly between a buyer and a seller, but we also went ahead and proved that you could settle transactions uh, in two tiers in the blockchain uh, based on the same outstanding credit between two parties. Um, and even better than that, you could do that at a lower transaction cost than if you did this um, in a traditional banking infrastructure. And uh, kind of just to tease the banks, we, uh, we executed the, those transactions on a holiday um, just to show that uh, there are no limits here. With that, uh, back to you, uh, Sven. Oh, thank you very much, Kat. Um, so uh, our, our shared mission, um, Monarium and Tradeshift has been to foster a sustainable, secure and frictionless global economy. Um, even doing away with the friction of holidays for certain types of transactions, as Gert explained. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, together um, at Monarium and Trade, we have some really exciting things we would like to share with you soon. Um, so please visit our website. And with that, I'd like to wrap up and there's the final slide. Um, I invite you, uh, the audience, to join the Monarium Sandbox. Um, just like trade shift, um, if you'd like to join the sandbox and um, start experimenting with your uh, transactions uh, involving your own digita digitized assets on chain. Thank you. Thanks, guys. This, that was fantastic. Um, I mean, I I'll just jump in quickly before we take any questions from the audience. But I mean, for me, that's a real sort of penny drop there because. You, know, you guys must get really tired of this question from blockchain people. Saying, when, you know, you, you got into blockchain in the last couple of years, but it, you know, you guys become a unicorn. You did, did pretty well with just cloud and digitization of, of, of supply chains and, and the blockchain part was added on, it seems. But I can see now the, the importance of it. It's cash on the ledger. That, that's really the use case that's become, and, and with the e-money part of that, um, as I said, regulated part of that, which creates this deep tier finance that you're talking about. Um, there's not a question in there. That's just an observation. But I think it's that, that's kind of accurate, right? Get. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I agree. I've got, question. I've got a question. Hang on. Here's a question for you. Let's just say, I mean, say you didn't use e money, right? Uh, which is great, but would you have used a stable coin or something like that eventually to solve this problem? I, I, I think that's a good question. And, and actually, that, that's kind of where we, we started our search. Um, um, because I, I do think there, there are some very interesting uh, stablecoin projects out there. But what is also very clear is that a stablecoin does not translate to money. It's, it's an asset type. And, and for the most part, it's, it's an asset type that doesn't live under a known regulatory regime. And, and that's an immediately scary way for, for most business. Uh, so, so while I, I, I very much like kind of the, the, the big picture vision of that direction, it poses an immediate question and that's how are you going to drive volume to the blockchain that you can actually work with um, and, and create services uh, around? That's going to get very hard if, if what you're trying to ask business to do, that's to enter this unknown regulatory gray zone uh, where, where that they cannot explain to 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 their accountants or, or counterparties, and that, and that's a kind of very uh, difficult place to enter, and and then uh, meeting up with, with Sven and Munir, 
we saw, well, but here's actually a paradigm where you can kind of get the best of both worlds because you can still do things on chain. Uh, we did this on, on Ethereum, which shows that you can actually do this kind of thing on a public ledger, mm -hmm. but still in a, in a well-defined regulatory environment. And you can have all the promise of, of creating broad kind of community-based efforts uh, that are open versus some of the, the more locked down uh, enterprise blockchains. So, so to me, that was a very nice uh, uh, proof point. Uh, to give some, add some background from uh, the perspective of Monarium, um, we were lucky enough to be early in blockchains uh, and the founding team also had experience from capital markets and central banking and uh, regulatory. So we started out soon after Ethereum was launched. We realized the potential of Ethereum for digitizing assets, but we realized also that the uh, trading mainstream assets would depend upon having a reliable representation of traditional money on chain. So we looked around um, and uh, we tried to find the most solid representation of fiat in digital form. And um, we identified e-money as the, the best possible form. It's a proven um, regulatory regime, which, which has been in existence for over two decades in a major jurisdiction. Um, and uh, so we started um, with the most trusted, proven, reliable form of money um, and, uh, and then built the blockchain interface to that, um, as opposed to starting from the other end. So stable coins um, are, in our view, interesting experiments uh, to a certain extent, but they are as um, essentially just a collection of um, non-uniform um, user agreements by private companies, um, which uh, have unproven, uh, for example, legal history. So in our view, those you, you can use them for certain purposes, but in um, mainstream commerce, they will not suffice. Um, and just, you know, just quickly, I just I don't know how much time we've actually got left, but uh, I just want to get this in now, because if anyone was watching this morning, uh, our enterprise uh, blockchain session that we're doing, I got to the point where I was asking Gert about this fantastic thing you're doing with the, the, the government of Denmark, and Zoom decided to do a global update. So we got interrupted. So I'm going to take the opportunity now to say that I think it's a brilliant thing. I should probably have said there is a story on our website about that as well. But Gert, do you want to just explain now that we've got a moment, this great COVID relief thing you're doing, it's going to free up, I think, $55 billion from uh, the block from Danish supply chains. And this can be rolled out to other places. Tell us about it. Yeah, no. So so the basic, the basic idea here is um, essentially that, that the state goes in and says, you know, so the problem is liquidity in the supply chains and, and banks are unwilling in uncertain times to actually lend money to companies. So, so the idea is to really turn it around and say, what if buyers would, would, would promise to pay their sellers on day one and protect the supply chains and protect the economy from the fallout that, that we saw uh, during last uh, financial crisis when, when whole supply chains collapsed. Um, and banks can, of course, go in and offer guarantees, and they do that today. So you could say the only little thing we added was to say, so what if you had this, uh, the digital ledger of the transactions between the companies? So you can actually create the transparency into what, what is it actually that, that, that sellers are invoicing buyers, and what is the buyer's response to this, and when do the sellers get paid? So the moment you have a history uh, and you can show you actually pay your sellers on 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 day one, mm -hmm. uh, and then everything that triggers uh, the payment of um, of the interest by by the state towards a bank. So so basically give a guarantee for for <laughs> the payment of of the interest on on those uh, early payments to to sellers. That's that's a very very low risk. Um, uh, 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 proposition basically so for very small budget uh, a few uh, hundred millions of, of Danish kroners you can actually release uh, what is almost 400 billion Danish kroners uh, so it could have a huge impact on society and also the moment the state steps, steps out of this you can replace that with uh, private incentives 
And as we showed in the case here with Monerum and the IKEA case, there are some obvious ways to, to kind of lower the risk in those transactions. And we are right now discussing this with Danish government and, and UK government. And those, so those, those governments are, they're entertaining this, they're, they're listening, because you're already working with the, the export, the Danish export, which is a government agency, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, That's correct. If they're watching, you know, you know, do it, <laughs> go for it. I think we're, we're, we're coming to the end. We're running out of time here, guys, but I just want to say thanks so much um, for um, drilling into this. It's a really exciting use case. Uh, you know, you've got the, you've got the, the, the firms on the platform, you've got the network effect right there. You just need to, to, to get going with it, I guess. So really great. Um, uh, so thanks both, thanks both of you. Uh, and we're gonna move into our next, our next and final slot now. So thanks. Thank guys. you. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Great stuff. And so I would like to introduce our last session and that is Sku Chain, which is one of the very, uh, first companies to get into uh, blockchain and supply chains and trade finance and all that good stuff. Uh, they boast an actual sea captain and their team. Uh, and um, they're going to talk today about stuff that they're, that they're doing with COVID, essential supply chain work they're doing with COVID. And um, we've got with us today Michael Loney from Mizuhu. We've got Yushioro Yushinari from Mitsubishi. Uh, Sunil William from Asian Development Bank, Matthew Froling from HSBC, and Sravinisam Saram from Scoochain. So guys, I will turn it over to you to tell us all about this stuff. Go on. Well, thank you, Ian, and thank you everybody for joining us at this uh, consensus panel. Uh, you know, so all of us have had a chance for the last many years to be looking at the blockchain hype go up and down and we at SkewChain have been focused very steadily on trying to ensure that we have real use cases that uh, articulate the value of the blockchain. Uh, in these times of COVID, talking about what the previous panelists were talking, we in fact are working with uh, the city of LA uh, doing something very similar. We have one of the largest counties in the Southeast of the United States also working with us to try to make sure that they can have your local suppliers be financed by the local banks uh, on, on a platform. And all the panelists we have today are actively working on specific aspects of a payment commitment that makes all of this thing happen. So uh, Ian, I mean, as a moderator, uh, take it from here and you know we can figure out how we wanna do this whole panel. Yeah, um, well, I, I don't know if you guys want to take it in turns to um, to talk about about the COVID stuff, or I can certainly um, come in with. I mean, from what I from what I gather, the PPE market in for COVID supply chains is a crazy market with all sorts of things that can go wrong and uh, all, all sorts of problems. I mean, I, I mean, maybe even start off with some anecdotal stuff about what you've encountered servicing. I know it's Dade County in Florida, LA, and New York. So all three of them are people we are talking to. I'll give you some specific uh, anecdotes that might highlight the problem. So today, if you wanted, oh, well, the last three, four weeks, I mean, things are changing on a 24 hour basis. If you wanted to get N95 masks or maybe ISO gowns uh, from China, uh, you effectively have to pay 50% upfront or maybe even 60 or 75% upfront. Uh, then once you pay them in US dollars, if they can't deliver, it's a hassle to bring those uh, foreign exchange in a local currency back. So there are two levels of uh, financing that are needed. One is the time that you actually have the product in the hands, say of the city of New York, uh, but their invoices, they've reduced it from 60 and 90 days to seven days, but even seven days can be quite a lot if you're a small business uh, with cash flow needs. And then you've got to put 50% up front and you're not sure whether the goods are going to be arriving, not arriving, there are all of these risks involved. So there are different a set of risks. And what we've been able to do is have different types of financiers help with different sets of risks. So we actually have a couple of uh, asset managers in New York helping us with the first set of risks because uh, banks are not in a position to take the risk of purchase order financing, if you will, a prepayment risk. However, banks can take the risk of uh, post 
uh, shipment, if you will, once the goods are accepted. So these are different types of risks that we've been able to accommodate on our platform. Can you, you I don't suppose you could name the asset managers you've been working with? Uh, so I'm not sure yet of the confidentiality requirements, but there's a, a group called Urban Us that we've been talking to. And Urban Us out of New York uh, actively works with small businesses and have shown a lot of interest. So we're actively talking to them to bring them onto our platform. Uh, there are a number of others who have expressed interest whose names I can't yet reveal. But this gives you an idea that we can bring third party money and third party financiers who are familiar with some of these uh, um, entities. Uh, the group that we are working with who's actually doing the importing is a group called 10X Beta. Uh, 10X Beta is uh, a, a small company, but they've got a lot of good sort of a background in, in the medical space. And so people based upon their history are and familiar with them are willing to finance them. And so from the prepayment aspect, we are able to get financing for those kinds of transactions. Great stuff. And um, out, of, out, of the, out of your other chaps, I don't know, um, you know, Michael or someone, do you want to um, tell us what you've learned from, from this crisis period and what hurt you could come out of the necessity of this COVID uh, situation we're in and supplying people with the right stuff? Mike, you're on mute. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Great, thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Mike Lonnie. First, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, uh, Consensus 2020 and our friends at SKU Chain uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, but just to follow up on what uh, Sri Navasam had mentioned, uh, both in Asia and in the US, we've been approached uh, on a number of occasions by uh, you know, uh, SMEs uh, and even some entrepreneurs to uh, look to arrange some uh, pre-shipment and post-shipment financing for uh, PPE equipment. Uh, and to his point, it's very difficult right now, given the current uh, market conditions, uh, which I can highlight in a moment, uh, that uh, financial institutions are gonna be uh, you know, well prepared to arrange that type of financing given this, uh, this environment. So indeed, um, you know, having these uh, smaller companies that uh, Shunab Assam has, has spoken about and uh, some government agencies um, ar around to facilitate this would be tremendously uh, supportive to that sector. Um, and yeah, it's sorry. No, I jump in. Chime in Hi, guys. thank you. It's Matt. My my name is Matt Froling, and I, I'm with HSBC. And you know, this is these these uh, challenging times do present a lot of of opportunities. And as you know, as has been mentioned, um, there's a lot of displacement right now. There's a lot of need, obviously, in the United States of America for the PPE equipment. And unfortunately, uh, for better or for worse, the supply chains are, uh, number one, they're international, and number two, there's a lot of unknown, all the parties are unknown to each other. So it's a really classic example of a, a core trade, we call it, you know, letter of credit situation without the time for a letter of credit uh, or the infrastructure for a letter of credit. Uh, you know, the sellers want surety of, of payment and the buyers want surety of goods. So, you know, this is a type of time where, you know, we're seeing at HSBC the, the path towards dig digitization has accelerated immensely where, you know, we were looking at uh, clients going fully digital over, over the course of a couple of years. We, we now feel that we're going to be measuring that in, in months. And you know, blockchain transactions do provide the stepping stone for uh, financial institutions like ourselves to be able to get involved in these transactions to make a difference. Uh, and you know, where you know, when you can take a transaction that has historically taken 10 to 15 days and bring it down to to one day, you're you know, you're really introducing some some value in there. So. You know, we at HSBC work with a number of partners. We, we've been working on a transaction with, uh, with SKU Chain as well. It's all new. Uh, unfortunately, the, <clears throat> the building blocks out there are, are sort of still under construction. Um, I think in a year or two, this is gonna be a, a, lot more, a lot more mature so that actual financial flows will be able to happen a lot more seamlessly. Um, but the, the need is certainly there. And you know we've been approached by a lot of sellers and buyers trying to get 
get get together, uh, get the physical and the financial together, uh, and and you know blockchain technology provides that uh, you know provides that solution. And, and how many transactions, Matthew, have you been? achieving have you been finalizing and settling in this area we've done at hsbc we've done uh over not not too many over 20 transactions across 11 offices with three financial institutions um value is pretty good about 50 million dollars so you know we're 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 moving along um i think financial and other financial institutions that you know, we work with are, are sort of struggling with the same thing. There's not this, this, this hyper growth that, that, that people are, are hoping for. And a lot of it's because lack of, um, you know, lack of a common platform, um, you know, so, you know, Scoot Chain's out there, excellent, excellent technology, excellent solutions. There are others out there as well. So, you know, banks are trying to find a place to go. Technology providers are trying to find banks to help. Um, so there's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be a time where, you know, it's almost like speed dating at this point. Things will come together. Uh, you know, it's just a question of when. And I think when there is some confluence there, you're going to see a lot more financi- financing going through the, you know, going, going through the various channels. Great stuff. And uh, Yuichiro, do you want to chip in here? And tell yeah. Us yeah. The, firstly, thank you very much for having me uh, at this great uh, event. Uh, the, actually, the, I prepared uh, some presentation to explain the, what is uh, our challenge uh, in uh, coronavirus era. That, uh, can I show the, my video? Go uh, ahead. Okay. All right. Let me see. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Right. There you go. Yeah. All right. Uh, the, 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 my name is uh, Yuichiro Yoshinari of uh, Silicon Valley Branch of uh, Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, the, today, uh, I would like to share uh, about uh, our challenges and the uh, case study uh, using the uh, SkuChain blockchain uh, system. Uh, the, this is the, just uh, explain the, the, the who we are. The, the maybe you know the Mitsubishi Group is the uh, Japanese largest uh, conglomerate. Uh, which consists of uh, over 30 companies. And uh, the Mitsubishi Corporation is the uh, 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 largest uh, Japanese uh, general trading and investment company uh, we call the Sogo Shosha. The, the, the I am uh, innovation lead uh, covering the mineral resources and the mining, as well as the industrial material group uh, from a 10 business group on the bottom of the district. The, actually, the, the, we own. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. The, actually, the, the, we own the 1,200 subsidiaries globally, uh, like a private equity, and uh, each group is uh, doing uh, global uh, trade of goods uh, from other Japanese or the uh, the foreign companies or uh, from our subsidiaries as a maker or manufacturer. So the the this is a. Uh, 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 this is uh, to explain that what's the bottleneck uh, we are facing in a real business uh, for the uh, global trade so when uh, we proceed the digital transformation in uh, global trading. And uh, uh, the, the first three, no. mm, I... yeah. the first three, the, we have to communicate uh, and collaborate with uh, too many stakeholders, like uh, not only supplier, buyer, uh, but also government and the financial institution, the bank or insurance company. And uh, the, the two old system, the, there are many written and unwritten practice in the global trade actually, that's the reality. And uh, the next one is uh, the too many paper documents. The still paper is a center of a process. And uh, finally, uh, the other culture, the, the the, 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 everybody is very conservative to introduce a new technology. The, and the whole system is optimized locally in a narrow area, but not broadly in the whole supply chain. But that's the reality we are facing. And the, the, 
I would like to show the, some examples of the challenges. Uh, the, the, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, I would like to Google about the history of the of credit. And uh, uh, it was invented by the Arabian, the merchant to, to trade the goods that are between Asia and the European uh, Europe and in the 13th century. The, the current LC system started the late 19th century. And uh, document handling practice doesn't fit to the current business requirements of a speed. Actually, the, uh, after the shipment, after the, the, the goods shipped from the warehouse in uh, the origination country, the, actually the, what we are doing is that we are sending the BL, bill of rating by FedEx. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting, it's a very, it looks very odd. It's a, uh, it's a parting from the original design of uh, LCO or BL system. Uh, and uh, the, we have to, the finally the, we have to hand over uh, the document to the bank. Uh, and uh, the, this is uh, triggering uh, unnecessary stress at the, our back office under uh, COVID-19 or the, the uh, work from home economy actually. That, that's the, uh, the challenging for us right now. And uh, this is uh, my uh, re uh, most recent uh, favorite joke. Uh, that it's uh, true that uh, we have to adapt a new normal without, uh, without any prejudice actually, yeah. Uh, let's move on. Yeah, so the, the, from the, here that I would like to show the case study uh, about uh, the usage of blockchain in commodity trading. The, it was a very early or very first project in the Mitsubishi to utilize blockchain technology for real commodity trade operations. Uh, start, we started from a tracking of the bill of rating and also the shipment uh, between shipper and the customer uh, using uh, SkuChain platform. And uh, we confirmed uh, a very robust ROI uh, uh, in terms of the cost reduction. And uh, the, this is a takeaway uh, from the, our uh, project. The document transfer, as well as uh, email communication with attachment file uh, is a uh, bottleneck for the digital transformation. And uh, the, the technology like blockchain, obviously it's not the ultimate purpose, but uh, it's a can uh, drive us uh, to transform our business. And uh, uh, we confirmed uh, the potentiality of a blockchain through the project. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the learning is that we needed to find an effective use case to maximize blockchain the capability, and not for uh, all application, but uh, the, if we can effectively apply the blockchain to the, some specific area that we can get a very a strong return uh, uh, from the, the uh, from the project. And the uh, next challenge is uh, uh, what we are thinking is uh, how we can apply the DLPC, uh, distributed ledger payment commitment mechanism to real trade. That's the uh, we are uh, seriously thinking uh, for the next step. So that's all from my side. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. That was excellent. Um, I mean, you know, just taking it back to, to, to the sort of the, the technology that, and what Scoochain is doing right now um, and why you guys are probably excited about it. Um, what I notice is that, you know, it's almost like a pattern. You guys have created a, a standard, a, a distributed ledger payment commitment standard, something like that. And, and this can run on other blockchains. And, and we, you know, a, 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 the, a, another company that's done this very successfully, for example, is Digital Asset, who, are, who have got a demo language that runs on pretty much anything. Um, I, I mean, Sri, was that, was that the kind of plan? I mean, yeah, and, and how's, that, that's, how's that working out? It seems to be going pretty good. Uh, let me share a slide and I'll walk you through uh, what it is that we have done here. Uh, so if you can see my screen, mm -hmm. are, you, are you able to see it? Yeah. Does, does it show the slide? There you go, yep. It does, okay. <clears throat> so uh, this is a simple trade that we've got highlighted here where you've got a seller and then you might have a trading company or an in-transit hub, a contract manufacturer in the middle, and then a buyer. 
Uh, so it took us about three and a half years after we did the first letter of credit transaction between Wells Fargo and the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, we realized that banks are great partners, uh, but what we really needed to do was to find a solution that works for enterprises. So that was the first stage of our pivot to focusing on enterprises as a customer and not the bank as a customer. Uh, we then initiated with uh, BAP, which is the Bankers Association for Trade, uh, a working committee uh, to try to understand uh, around uh, how do we think of this instrument that could potentially not replace a letter of credit, but take the essence of it. And that's the payment commitment. So over three years, uh, 18 uh, large banks, a uh, number of others worked together in this working committee that we at SKU Chain were actually chairing uh, to come up with the standard, which is now known as the DLPC or the Distributed Ledger Payment Commitment and is a best practice. It's taken a long time because uh, although the standard by itself is uh, from a data perspective, relatively small and simple, the legal structure around it and the ability to be able to understand what was the atomic nature of it, I think took a fair amount of time uh, to put together. What we began to recognize is that if you look at the BPO four corner model and all of the different uh, SWIFT sort of instruments and the way in which banks operated, that what was really needed was a way by which we could take the essential element, which is the payment commitment. Now, there is document acceptance, there are all kinds of other things that a letter of credit does, but if you unbundle the letter of credit, uh, you can begin to start seeing how different pieces of technology can attack different parts of the problem. And the core problem as we saw it that we as a Silicon Valley startup could really sort of undertake was the DLPC. Now, digitizing the bill of lading is another problem. People like IBM and others have tried, but that's a, uh, as, as Yoshinari-san brought up, it's a local issue. You know, many, many ports still want paper and, and whatever kind of standard somebody comes up with uh, in, in, in a different geography may not apply in say uh, at, at, at the local port level. So that's a harder problem to solve, but this was maybe a problem that we at, as a Silicon Valley company could attack. So what we did was we essentially allowed the ability of uh, our platform to produce this asset called the DLPC and drop it onto another blockchain platform. We chose uh, Corda because Corda is being used by uh, more than 40 plus banks. And uh, I think it's slowly becoming the blockchain of choice for banks. And uh, you have the Marco Polo network, you've got uh, Retrade, which are on Hyperledger Fabric and Contour on, on um, Corda, all essentially being used by banks. And this gave us the opportunity to allow any bank to effectively work with an instrument that was easily portable, uh, interoperable, transportable, and more importantly, could be financed against. Uh, we actually did the interoperability with the Corda network. We are working with all of the panelists as, as we have on the stage today uh, to actually do the first transaction with the DLPC. We see this as being a fundamental uh, strut in the new commerce rails. Fantastic, and I believe that your, uh, your, your partnership with Corda, with R3, is, is quite recent. It's like in the last month or so, right? That yeah. is correct. Uh, so R3 and SKU Chain have a long history. We know them from their early days and they know us from our early days. Uh, they've gone through their sort of growth and understanding. Uh, we too have gone through our growth and understanding. Uh, the reason we felt that now was the right time to partner is because uh, they have quote the Corda network, which is uh, not a public network, but maybe <laughs> a larger network, which uh, is essentially, you could sort of think of it as quasi public, although it's commissioned. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we think that that can become a sort of a mainstream bank method to actually transfer assets amongst each other. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I just think it's interesting that uh, earlier on, uh, the panel er earlier on, and, and uh, they, they broke this news, well, it came out of stealth that they were, uh, you know, that teaming up with Kaleido, which is a kind of a, you know, an Ethereum affiliated group. And, you know, you're, they're working with you as well. And it's just like Corda, just, it's a sort of ninja approach that they're, they're just coming by stealth just to get, uh, take everything over. So uh, kudos to them. So you're working with Marco Polo, Trade IX. 
Uh, so we're not yet working with them. Uh, they are on Carta, are the banks we are working with have sort of plans to work uh, or diff underway in different plans with them. We do hope over the next few months to actually find ways that we can interoperate with both the Marco Polo and Contour networks. Excellent. Well, listen, guys, I think we're, I think we're coming to the end of the time here. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for excellent, excellent explanation and, and keep up the excellent work, good work with uh, COVID PPE supplies. It's a, it's a really important thing you're doing. Um, so just want to thank all of you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Great guys, great stuff. And I think with that, we're going to go into our next panel, which I believe is IOV Lab, which will be starting shortly. Um, don't forget, uh, New York Block TV Gives. We have a charity. Um, it's got quadratic funding, it, uh, which was invented by Vitalik Butarin. Uh, please take part. So I'm going to say thanks, everyone, and cheers.